Good Sunday morning, everybody. How's it going? So, news is a little slow right now. We had a little burst of activity thanks to the Alden Smith signing, which was a blessing from the football gods during the two weeks before the draft to have something concrete and real to talk about. But um, things have slowed back down a little bit ever since we picked up Alden. So I thought I'd go ahead and talk about a little rumor, a kind of a non-story that got me thinking about a couple things about this team and the mentality that this team should have. So in the last, I'd say, 12 hours, there have been a series of stories released about the Seahawks basically saying that the team is high on Freddie Swain. And they think he can be the number three wide receiver in this offense, which is why they haven't really been going after receivers in free agency. They think Swain can be the guy to compliment Metcalf and Lockett. So, I don't have an issue with being high on Freddie Swain. I don't. I know there are a lot of Seahawks fans who are as well. There's reason to be high on him. Some reason. He did make some plays as a rookie. He did show some promise, and I even think there's reason to believe he might fit in well with the Shane Waldron offense if you take a look at the way he plays. So I'm not here to criticize Freddie Swain, but I want to talk about this mentality, this idea of being good enough with whatever it is that you have to work with. Because I do think that mentality, and I see Seahawks fans have this mentality, and I try to draw it into question where I see it. But to see the team seem to have this mentality, that kind of perturbs me a little bit. And I wanted to talk about why. And I hope that being high on Freddie Swain would not change the way this team chooses to do business this offseason if the opportunity to get better comes. So here's the thing. This Seattle Seahawks team, as of right now, is clearly in a particular state. It is the state of going all out to win a Super Bowl now. They're not trying to gear up for two years. They're not trying to blow it up and rebuild. They're not trying to tank to get the number one pick to get the franchise QB. They are trying to win a Super Bowl right now. There are many reasons why this is obvious. The fact that we have a QB making $35 million a year, the fact that we have several elite, high-paid, or high, highly drafted, in some cases, pieces throughout the core of the roster, it's pretty obvious that this team is trying to win a Super Bowl now. So, that being the case, doesn't it make sense that you should always be trying to get better on your roster? as long as you can, for as much as you can. So, let's take a look at the Seahawks roster as I see it right now. And I'm not going to go through the exact contract situation with this team right now. I've done it before. You can go watch the old videos on it. If you've been watching on the channel for a while, you've probably seen these videos. But long story short, I believe that the Seahawks have the ability to obtain enough cap room to sign one, maybe two more veteran players on top of the draft picks that they have that they'll use to bring in new players as well. So I believe there is money there and there is a little bit of draft capital there. I'll, I'll grant you not a lot. We're working with very few chips at the draft table this year. Sure. But... I look at this mentality, this mentality I saw here, this idea of Seattle being high on Freddie Swain and not really looking for another receiver, another number three receiver, because they have him. And I think, is that really the mentality that you want to have as a team trying to go win a Super Bowl now? When you take a look at the Seahawks roster right now, because, as we just said, we are in Super Bowl now mode, you should be taking a look at every position and every positional group on this team and thinking, can we make it better in theory? Can we make it better in practice? Would making it better make this team appreciably better in the win-loss column and on the field? And 
would it be cost effective to get better at this position, be it money or draft capital? And if the answer to all four of those questions is yes, then you should probably do it. I'll give you a few examples of what I'm talking about when, I'm, when I say that. Let's take safety. Let's take the safety position. Okay, can the Seahawks get better at the safety position in theory? Not really, right? We probably have the best safeties in the league. Jamal Adams is an all-pro. Quandre Diggs is a pro bowler. We might have the best safeties in the league. You can't really get better than this. I guess technically you could replace Quandre Diggs with Buda Baker, but that's getting to be absurd. I mean, what do you want? Do you want your whole team to just be a bunch of clones of Troy Polamalu and Ed Reed? No, can't really get better at safety. Okay, let's do quarterback. <clears throat> Can we get better at quarterback in theory? Yeah, I guess. Can we get better at quarterback in practice? No. What are we going to do? Trade for Patrick Mahomes? Chiefs aren't going to do that. We're going to trade for Deshaun. Well, maybe you could trade for Deshaun Watson, but no, just no. We have, um, there's something going on there. I think we all understand that. You're going to trade for Lamar Jackson? No, Raven's not going to do that. Uh, you going to trade for Aaron Rodgers? No. No. Okay, so yeah. Quarterback is what it is. We can't get better at quarterback, so let's move on. Um, Nick Ballore, fullback. Can you get better than Nick Ballore in theory? Yeah. Can you get better than him in practice? Probably. I'm sure if you called a team that has a better fullback than Nick Ballore and offered up some real capital for a trade, they would say, yeah, we'll give you our fullback. Would getting a better fullback make this team appreciably better on the field? No. We don't even really use a fullback, and even if we did, he's a fullback. So no, we don't need to get better at fullback. Then you do have those positions where I and some Seahawks fans disagree, but I do think there's a good debate to have. Like, for example... Oh, I don't know. Center. Ethan Posick. Can we get better than Ethan Posick at center in theory? Yeah, Ethan Posick might not be um, a top 20 starting center in the NFL. There are a lot of centers out there who are better than Posick. Can we get better than Ethan Posick in practice? That's where the debate comes in. Because I've gone on record many times saying I don't really like the centers in this draft class, at least not the ones at the top, and I don't think any of them are going to fit what Shane Waldron's trying to build on offense. Now, there are Seahawks fans who disagree with at least one or two of those prospects, and that's fine. There are a couple who think that Posick is so bad that it doesn't matter if they fit the scheme or not. Anybody else would be better. I, I really don't agree with those takes, but... It is debatable, I will grant you that, which is why some Seahawks fans spend so much time thinking about how we can get better at center. Now, five, six weeks ago, I did want to get better at center, which is why I said that Corey Lindsley was my number one free agency target in uh, um, free agency, but didn't happen. And then I also said I wanted to take a look at David Andrews, Austin Blythe, Ted Karras. Didn't happen. So as of right now, can the Seahawks get better at center in practice? Uh, I don't know. It's a, to me, it's a tough question to answer. So I kind of feel like, even though I know Posick is average to slightly above average at best, we might just kind of have to roll with that. That might be one of those situations where you have to shrug your shoulders and say, okay, this is the best we can do. Good enough is going to have to be good enough. Because when you're doing this, you have to be balanced. We want to get better, but we also know we can't summon a genie that'll wave a magic wand and turn an all-pro out of out of a pile of hay, right? We can't just call up a genie and say, hey, we want an all-pro center just produced right in front of us out of nowhere who will play for a hot dog. No, that's not what I'm saying. We have to actually decide if this is practical. And in the case of Posick, we decided that even though we could get better in theory, in practice, and getting better at center would help this team, we decided that it wasn't cost-effective because Corey Lindsley cost so much money. So we decided to sit it out, and we looped back around with Posick. Okay, not saying it's a great idea, not saying it's going to work, 
But at this point, I think that Postic is probably the best we can do unless you want to maybe go get Austin Ryder. And the fact that Ryder's still out there kind of makes me think that maybe there's something up with him. But anyway, Brandon Shell, here's another one that's worth a spirited debate on. Brandon Shell, can we get better at right tackle than Brandon Shell in theory? Sure, there are definitely better right tackles than him. Can we do it in practice? I think so. Maybe we have a shot at it. It's not overly likely, but we have a chance. I don't think we could have done it in free agency. I didn't see any right tackles in free agency that would have been appreciably better than Shell. Um, I wasn't paying a ton of attention to right tackles in free agency, I will grant you, but I really don't think we could have done that much better than Shell. Um, would it help this team to get better at right tackle than Shell? I would say so. I think an upgrade at right tackle means a lot. Is it cost effective? That's where it kind of gets a little hard to answer this because there are three rookies in this draft class who I think could start day one over Brandon Shell, but you might not have a chance at any of them. So that's why when I make these videos, I talk about the idea of drafting somebody like Samuel Cosme, who's my favorite, who I think could start over Brandon Shell as a rookie. I think that Dylan Radnans could, could as well. But I also try to keep it real, and I don't think Brandon Shell's that bad. I think he's all right. I think he's pretty good, actually. Right tackle's hard. So that's a position where I think you can make the argument that we can get better at right tackle, but it might be too expensive. We might not have the draft capital to turn it out. We might not be able to get somebody at a high enough draft point to actually start over Shell because those guys are going to go quickly. But... When I take a look at the wide receivers on this team, I see two guys at the top who I really like, although Lockett's getting older and starting to wear down, and I'm a little concerned about him. And then I see Freddie Swain, and I know some people really like him, and that's cool. I have no problem with that. There are experts on YouTube who study game film and tape and say that Freddie Swain's going to be good. Uh, top Billin, I think, has made at least one video about how Freddie Swain's going to be the real deal. But I can't help but get perturbed when I see Seahawks fans say things like, we don't need Antonio Brown because we have Freddie Swain. Let's try to keep it real with what Freddie Swain is. Freddie Swain is a sixth round pick out of Florida where his best season and only notable season at receiver was one, his, his last year at Florida where he had barely more than 500 receiving yards. And he had a real quarterback, by the way. He had Kyle Trask throwing him the ball. <clears throat> Freddie Swain is a player who has 13 career receptions at wide receiver. Antonio Brown is one of the five greatest receivers in NFL history. He is going to the Hall of Fame unless he completely loses his mind. He made All-Pro first team four years in a row. I'm not saying you have to bring him in. There are valid reasons to not bring in Antonio Brown. He's old. He might not fit the system. He might not want to block. For, he might not want to be a blocker. He might not. He, he might go crazy. He might be an idiot. He might ruin the team. There are valid reasons to not bring in AB. But because we have Freddie Swain is not a valid reason. Not for this team. Why do we need to see... This mentality of let's see what the young guys can do is okay in some circumstances, but we've got one of the greatest receivers in NFL history out there on the free agency wire. This is an opportunity to go, okay, young guy, you're going to have to wait another year to really get your chance. By the way, Freddie Swain's still going to get his chance. He's just going to get fewer of them. He's still going to be the number four. He's still going to get on the field a few times a game. Somebody's probably going to get hurt and he'll get out there. Don't worry about Freddie, okay? This is an area where the Seahawks can easily and clearly get better. The wide receiver three spot. A.B., Golden Tate. Now, there are also reasons why you wouldn't want to bring in Golden Tate. But he would be better than Freddie Swain, I can tell you that. And then you have countless guys in the draft who I fully believe are going to be better than Freddie Swain out of the box. Diami Brown, Nico Collins, uh, Imar Smith-Marset, 
uh, maybe Austin Watkins. There are a lot of guys in the draft who I like at receiver, and I'm very confident they could be better. And I see Seahawks fans say, we don't need to draft a receiver in the second round because we have Freddie Swain. I don't know. It just, it seems like such a backwards way of thinking about things. I'll give you another example, and this one's even more stark. Tight end. I did a stream a few days ago talking about drafting a tight end, using a second-round pick on Pat Friermuth, using a third-round pick on Tommy Tremble or Brevin Jordan, maybe even using a fourth- or fifth-rounder on Nick Eubanks, whatever. And I see comments, and I don't mean to throw anyone under the bus because, you know, everyone's allowed to like whoever they like, as much as they want to, and think as highly or as lowly of anybody on this team as they want to. I think that at a certain point you have to contend with facts, but if you happen to really like some of these players and you really want them to get their chance, then okay. But I see people come into my stream. I saw several comments from people saying, why would we draft a tight end? Because we have Colby Parkinson. At least Freddie Swain showed something as a rookie. At least he made some crucial plays to help us win a few games. Colby Parkinson has two career catches in garbage time. So, if you have the opportunity to go get a guy like a Pat Freermuth, who should be good for like 40 catches as a rookie out of the box, because that's how dominant he is physically, and you decide, no, we're good, we have Colby Parkinson... Let me tell you about Colby Parkinson. And again, I'm not here to tell you he's terrible and he sucks and he's never going to be anything in the NFL. I don't think that. But I'll tell you this. He is slow and I don't think he can block. That being the case, I think his best case scenario is a situational red zone player slash third down player. He can catch the ball. He's big. He runs good routes. Good hands. But... A guy who can't block and a guy with no foot speed? How's he ever going to be more than a tight end two at best in the NFL? So don't let your love for these players make you think that you can't get better at a couple positions. Because once again, I think it is easy for this team to get better at tight end. There are multiple tight ends we could get in this draft who I believe would be better not only than Colby Parkinson, but better than Will Disley as rookies. A couple of them might be better than Gerald Everett. And I like Gerald Everett, but you can't tell me that Pat Freermuth isn't going to be an immediate impact player in the NFL. So don't pass up the opportunity to go get somebody like that just because you've decided that you like Colby Parkinson, a fifth-round pick with two career catches, who has severe limitations in his skill set, might I add. I've often said, when talking about being a fan of the Seahawks and rooting for a football team in general that one of the first things that you learn in the advanced level of being a fan is how to objectively and fairly evaluate your players. When you realize how good your players actually are, it allows you to root for the team, not for the players. And I think that when a lot of people start out rooting for a particular team, they, they can't help but root for the players. They get attached to a certain player and they don't want to see that player go, even if that player sticking around is hurting the team. I see it all the time in other fan bases and I see it all the time here. So maybe that's what's happening here. Maybe a guy like Freddie Swain, sixth round pick, underdog story, doesn't have an offseason, goes out there last year, makes uh, 13 catches, scores a couple touchdowns. People kind of get into it. They get into the story, the underdog story, and they want to see him out there because they like him. Never mind the fact that it's pretty clear that you could make the team better by getting somebody else, many receivers in this draft and a couple in free agency, and putting Freddie Swain in the fourth string role. So, I, I'm not here to... I can never tell anybody how to root for a team, but I'm telling you guys... Being a fan of the team means figuring out objectively how good these players are. Freddie Swain showed some stuff, but he's got 13 career catches, and he was a sixth-round pick. He wasn't even very good in college. Colby Parkinson, he's got some upside, but he's got two career catches. He basically redshirted as a rookie, and he's got severe skill limitations. That's who they are. 
Don't think these guys are better than they are just because they have a Seahawks helmet on. Don't think they're better than they are just because you like them. If you can get better, again, ask yourself those four questions. If the answer to all four of those questions is yes, you should probably go ahead and get better if you're trying to win a Super Bowl right now, which is what this team is doing. So this video was a little different than the usual kind of video I make, but I wanted to kind of address this because, again, I, I saw this and I got a little concerned, a little perturbed that we might be settling for good enough. Good enough is not good enough when you're trying to win a Super Bowl. Sometimes it has to be. As of right now, I think Ethan Posick is going to have to just be good enough because I don't know if there's another center we can get that makes sense. It's possible Brandon Shell will have to be good enough because unless one of those top tackles falls to us, I don't know if we can get better than Shell. But we can get better than Freddie Swain easy. We can get better than Pat than than Will Disley and Colby Parkinson easy. Don't not do it just because you like these players. I'm going to get out of here. Peace out. Go Hawks. Another video later today. Streams later tonight. You guys know how we do it. Just something to think about. I don't know. Everybody's allowed to think whatever they want about particular players and what they want to see the team do. But at a certain point, you do have to decide, are you going to be a fan of the team or are you going to be a fan of the players? I know which side I'm on. Peace.